That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to this legislative body that serves the good of all people. I would be remiss if I didn't say that Abraham Lincoln would enjoy being with all of you, because we think of Abraham Lincoln as a president of the United States, and we all know that he served one term in Congress. But actually, he spent more time in the Illinois State Legislature than any other political career that he may have had. And so that's where he really learned the skills that made him who he was. There's a great book out there, and it talks about his journey to greatness and how it started in the State House of Representatives. So all of you could associate very well with Abraham Lincoln. Today, today history calls out across the ages. It beckons us to commemorate Abraham Lincoln's historic relationship with Pennsylvania. We should remember that the 16th president's ancestors once called Pennsylvania's home and that their blood is in this soil. His grandfather and namesake, Abraham Lincoln, was born in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and not in Illinois or not in Kentucky, but here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania played a crucial role in Lincoln's rise to power. At the 1860 Republican National Convention in Chicago, Pennsylvania was a major influence. Back then, the Keystone State held nearly one-fourth of the votes necessary to win the nomination. More votes at that time than California, Connecticut, Delaware, Vermont, and Michigan combined. Abraham Lincoln was not the front-runner at the convention. But Pennsylvania's decision to support Lincoln's candidacy at that nominating convention tipped the scales and changed the course of American history. And we can be proud of all of that today. As the Civil War bled the life out of America, two powerful armies clashed on the battlefield at Gettysburg. When it ended in July of 1863, some 51,000 casualties were claimed. It was the deadliest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. That November, the battlefield was to be dedicated as a cemetery, a final resting place. Abraham Lincoln was invited as an afterthought to provide what were called a few appropriate remarks. Instead, he delivered a transcendent eulogy, a timeless message. He immortalized the sacrifice of Gettysburg soldiers living and dead, a compact 272-word speech that is admired around the world. Gettysburg was Lincoln's supreme moment, and it took place on a battlefield here in Pennsylvania. The 16th president defined for all time death and sacrifice in defense of the United States of America. After four years and 41 days in office, Abraham Lincoln was taken by an assassin's bullet. His death shocked people around the world. It was decided that the body of the 16th president would be returned to his home of Springfield, Illinois, on a funeral train. After official ceremonies in Washington, D.C., the nine-car funeral train departed at 8 a.m. on the morning of April 21st. It would eventually pass through 444 communities in seven states. During its 1,654-mile journey, it would never travel faster than 20 miles an hour slowing to five miles an hour as it went through small towns and hamlets. The locomotives, many of them were used, over 42 different locomotives with American flags, and on the front of the big locomotive was a beautiful portrait of Abraham Lincoln. The day of departure, the first stop was Baltimore, where the 16th president would lie in state in an open coffin. After the official funeral, 
It was off again around 3 p.m. on the afternoon of April 21st. The funeral train departed Baltimore for the hills of Pennsylvania. The weather was warm and cloudy. Thousands of grieving mourners gathered at stations all along the route. This was unbelievable to see. We're talking about thousands of people lining the tracks all along the way. The route was federalized. The train was under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. Everyone in the North was lamenting the death of Abraham Lincoln. Around 5.30 p.m., 150 years ago today, near the Maryland-Pennsylvania state line, Governor Andrew Curtin and his staff were standing trackside to board the train. Curtin really admired Abraham Lincoln. In fact, without Curtin, Lincoln probably would never have even become president. Curtin was not feeling well, but he was still there. He realized this was important. In fact, he set the stage for a new precedent. And from there on out, at every state line, a governor would be there, not at their capital, but at the state line, waiting with their entourage. And they would stay with the funeral car until it departed their state. And that precedent was started here in Pennsylvania. So the governor boarded the funeral train. He'd even sent a letter to Mary Lincoln. He asked her, could you please stay with me and be my guest when you're in the state of Pennsylvania for the funeral? And of course, Mary Lincoln was so ill, she could never even leave Washington, never even was able to get out of bed for the funeral but the governor had asked her to be with him. And so as darkness fell on Pennsylvania on April 21st, it started to rain. And it was a driving rain, it was a pounding rain, it was one of those rains that we know it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And so as the funeral train neared York, there was a pilot engine that would travel before the big locomotive, before the funeral train itself, and that pilot engine would be out about 10 minutes in advance to make sure that the rails were safe and secure. So you can imagine what it was like to see the pilot engine come through, to York, through York, and then the nine-car funeral train. And then, as it pulled into York, the bells began to toll. Cannons boomed. A brass band played a funeral dirge, and people stood in profound sadness. The crowds were large in York. Thousands of people had lined the tracks. When the powerful locomotive came to a stop, six women, a number of women, had asked to come in and place flowers on the coffin. And it was decided only six of them could enter the funeral car. The mood of the Pennsylvania people there was one of somber and profound sadness. Women cried openly at York. After little more than five minutes, the train had to move on again. It had taken on water. At 6.50 p.m., the engine was powered up for the next stop, Harrisburg. It would reach this city 150 years ago tonight. As the train approached Harrisburg, it was about 8.15, a signal man posted the approach. The pilot engine had already passed. And then, cannon from the state capitol grounds, boom, followed by church bells tolling for our dead president. Everyone in this city was filled with emotion, sadness, and profound sorrow. The train arrived at the Pennsylvania Railroad Depot near Fifth and Market Streets. The military honor guard traveling with the train placed President Lincoln's coffin on a hearse pulled by four white horses. And it was dark outside, and it was a pouring rain. We can only imagine what it was like on that spring day. It was a large procession in the streets. There was a procession that would come to the Capitol. Military units marched with the funeral hearse. Cavalry, artillery units marched. Veterans from the War of 1812 marched. Local citizens of Harrisburg marched in the funeral cortege. State officials marched, 
And all along the way, these large cannon were firing. Boom, boom. Was something unequaled, really, in American history. And near 9 p.m., the entire route from the train station to the Capitol was lit up with chemical lights. The streets back then were caked with mud. Rivers of water bled in the streets. As they marched to the Capitol, it began to pour harder and harder, and violent thunderstorms had erupted, and the horses were upset and jumping. There were large signs along the way, and we know that as we're outside sometimes where there's no light and we see a flash of lightning, it lights the area up. And there were these large banners that read, a nation mourns its martyred father, a great man has fallen. And these banners were all throughout the city. The Capitol was draped in black. Crowds outside were immense, numbering in the tens of thousands. Around 9.30 p.m., public viewing of the open coffin began here in Harrisburg. Mourners moved through the House of Representatives at the rate of 4,000, over 4,000 an hour. And in order to accomplish this, they had taken the windows out of the building and placed steps outside. And so the wake lasted until only midnight. And at midnight, everything stopped. It wasn't until the next morning on Saturday morning, April 22nd, at daybreak, as the sun was coming up, the cannon began to fire again here in Harrisburg. Few in Harrisburg had slept that night. People were anxious, sad, and grieving. These were the words that were recorded over and over in diaries. And inside the House of Representatives, crossed battle flags of Pennsylvania regiments decorated the windows. Viewing of the open coffin began at 7 a.m. The flag flying above the Capitol was draped in black and flying at half-staff. And yet, as this is happening, the trains are still pouring into Harrisburg, and people are coming from all over in hopes of viewing Abraham Lincoln's face for one last look. And then, on that day, the viewing was sure. It lasted only a couple of hours. Around 10 a.m., the honor guard carefully placed the coffin on a hearse. Thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of people were still standing outside with the hope to get one last look at Abraham Lincoln, the man that had carried them through victory in the Civil War. In a total of five and a half hours of viewing here in Harrisburg, they estimated that more than 25,000 people had filed past the coffin. So the funeral procession began to march back to the train station. State Street, Front Street, Market Street, 50,000 people, 75,000 people. The numbers of the public outside was enormous. And yet, as this is happening, people are still pouring into Harrisburg on the trains with the hope to get one last look at Abraham Lincoln. Mourners were shocked and upset to learn that there would be no chance to view Abraham Lincoln's martyred face. One local newspaper here in Harrisburg proclaimed, today the people of the state capital of Pennsylvania bury their first great martyr, whose name and fame will go down in history as the noblest in the personal annals of the world. At 11.15 a.m., train was on the move again. The next funeral stop would be Philadelphia. Traveling to Philadelphia, the train would pass through many towns, small towns and hamlets. And in Lancaster, for example, at 1 p.m., the crowd was large there, perhaps 20,000 people along the tracks. 20,000 people. Congressman Thaddeus Stevens and former President James Buchanan were in the crowd. And all along the way, people would tip their hat. It was said that old Thad Stevens himself, who had been a man that always prodded Abraham Lincoln to do better, to be all that he could be, took his hat off in profound sadness. The train moved on slowly. Remember, 
five miles per hour as it went through these small towns and hamlets. And we can only imagine what it was like, that imposing funeral train, nine cars. We know what it sounds like, the hissing and sound of these big steam locomotives. I moved on and on, Coatesville, Downingtown, Oakland, Westchester. As the funeral train edged closer to Philadelphia, two miles out from the city, two miles out from the city, on broken lines of mourners standing along the tracks that far out. It was absolutely astonishing for those who were riding in the funeral train to see this. Every bo everyone aboard the train was absolutely shocked at the outpouring of grief of the people in Pennsylvania. And when the train arrived in Philadelphia around 5 p.m., the crowds were enormous. Abraham Lincoln would lie and stay inside Independence Hall next to the Liberty Bell. Pennsylvania would never forget its true friend. They said more than half a million people were in the streets in Philadelphia. Some said even more. Some papers reported three quarters of a million. In Philadelphia, lines to view the body stretched three miles long. They went westward to the Schuylkill River and eastward to the Delaware River. When all the funerals were over and Mr. Lincoln was back in Springfield, Illinois for that final farewell on May 4th, more than one million mourners had filed past his open coffin. Millions more had stood along the tracks and cried as the train rolled on. Just as it had in life, Pennsylvania played a major role in the funeral and in the enduring legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Today, today we commemorate the 16th president. We remember and honor all of those who died in the war from the North and from the South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honorable House of Representatives for making this historic occasion possible. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you.